To do characters well, you need to do a lot of traditional stuff like sculpting and figure drawing. Having background in traditional anatomy is, is absolutely pivotal. Uh, my mom and dad being doctors, they had all these medical books. So my first knowledge of anatomy came from that. They even had like this book about like the forensics, like the stuff that was like really disturbing when you're a kid. And you're probably not supposed to look at this stuff when you're like 10. And I think this with like dark fantasy movies and some metal music later on informed my art. Vitaly Bulgarov is a concept artist and designer for films, video games, and real world products. His designs, showcasing a blend of humanity and robotics, have been featured in major releases like Alita, Battle Angel, and Ghost in the Shell, as well as video games like Diablo, StarCraft, and his company's own original IP. Today, we spend some time with Vitaly in his home near Las Vegas, Nevada, to learn about his craft and the philosophies behind his work. Back in the day, my brother used to work in this local uh, internet cafe, which wasn't really a, a cafe and didn't even have internet. It just had a few computers. So it was just like a local gaming club. We would have to like sort of invent our own fun, right? Counter-Strike, when it just appeared, was like really popular. I discovered that there was this program called WorldCraft where you could make your own maps and plug in your own texture. And you know, I would like take a picture of the walls in some of the local environments. I think I even put my brother's surprised face in one of the like soldier guy there, because he was uh, not nice to me. At the same time in school, I had technical drawing class. Everybody hated it. I think I was the only guy who liked it. It was like very meticulous and you had to make like very precise lines. So that parallel to the uh, making your own maps in the video games, that was kind of like my starting point doing 3D. All of this was happening in this post-Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, 14,000 people town, right? You could find like a bombshell from the World War II at the airport, right? It's like a very different place, you know? So that was a very unique sort of context to be passionate about games in general. And that's when Blizzard Entertainment kind of became on my radar. They made this awesome cinematic, which was the thing called Building Better Marine. Even freedom has a price. And they showed how a Marine, which is like a unit from one of my favorite video games when I was a kid, StarCraft, they show how you build it, but really very, very close. And you would see how all the pieces of armor were built. And it was like this mechanical design porn, like no joke. Like you see that when you're 18 or 20 at the time, that was the most mind blowing thing ever. And I said, whoever are the people who do this thing, I want to work with those guys. Like they know what's up. It's about time. But then I was just obsessed with like Blizzard. I'm like, I need to get there. So I kept like doing more work. Uh, that's inspired by Blizzard uh, Entertainment's IPs. Like, hey, here's my version of a Zerg unit, and then here's my take on one of the Diablo designs. So I just kind of kept doing that because I was also a big fan of those games. And eventually, I think maybe I was just really persistent. They saw like maybe he can be of use. So back in 2008, I had an interview with Blizzard and I got the job. Like when I look back on my life, this is the most critical and, and important moment for me, not just professional career, but life-wise, as in terms of like the culture shift and everything, it was me moving to the States. Blizzard was definitely a really fun experience for me, both in terms of being an artist, but also just as a fan, because I was in the cinematics team and they get to touch and play with all major IPs to Blizzard Entertainment. So we formed this kind of a tight circle that was like a mix concept artists and modelers with a common uh, passion for mechanical design. So that trustful atmosphere and the environment where you could do studies and experiment with designs and actually take a lot of risk without being afraid by ridicule by your colleagues was a very, very warm and learning, promoting atmosphere. You know, I like this analogy of learning. You have one foot in order, one foot in chaos. And that's where real learning happens because your one foot in order is your area of expertise and competence. That's what gives you the confidence. But if you're like staying only in comfort zone, you never grow. If you go both feet in the dark water, you just die, right? Like the monsters will take you. But you, still, you, you put one foot in case, then no one, you know, the dark waters to play with things you're not really fully feel comfortable with to take some risk. So it was this part of this very healthy group where we would do stuff like this. Posting this stuff online 
I got called to work on Robocop. And in my mind, the self-identity me as a concept artist was me drawing. It was never thinking that I could actually do 3D modeling as a concept art. The production designer saw that, and then he saw some of my personal work. And he's like, wait, you can do this. Why even bother like drawing? I was like, well, because this thing takes like a month to model and I can sketch like 10 different sketches in one night. He's like, yeah, but it looks so much cooler. Just make this faster. I'm like, okay, I guess. Let me not sleep anymore. That's when I realized that my process wasn't fully honed in. Like I actually moved to Hawaii for just six months to completely kind of reinvent my process altogether. So I tried to diverse my modeling tools within three different branches. So one is sub-D, like a kind of quad-based, very production-friendly type modeling. The second would be ZBrush, which is like the digital sculpting side of things, and the CAD modeling, right? So the fun things start when you mix them up together. You know, like you would make a shape in ZBrush, a very quick, like fast shape, and then you use zero measure to make a quad-based geo out of it. Then you convert it to CAD, and then you do the final booleans in Moi, and then you have something that, you know, looks like it's been worked on for like weeks and it like only took an hour. Currently, I render pretty much everything in Octane. I used to render in Keyshot before I switched from CPU to GPU. Octane is one of the pretty obvious choices to me for rendering today because how little on the technical side you really need to know to get the photorealistic image. It's very easy to, to get into and start to play with it creatively. So in a way, you like keep concepting, but with materials and lighting. That's what I would show to my client. That's in terms of the software and the hardware. I currently use two machines, and one is just modeling and designing, right? And the second is purely for rendering. So the box machine is where I do this stuff, and then I send it via network to the seven GPU machine one to render everything in Octane. I'm still obsessed with modeling at this point. It's like 15 years later, nothing really changed. The tools got better, but the passion, the core of it is still the same. It's like you're just having fun with doing objects in 3D, like if it was a real life, but in like in a virtual space. I'm taking a break, make some noise and go back to work afterwards. Since I was a kid, I always kind of liked Dark Fantasy, you know, Lord of the Rings, both the book and the movie and played games like that. So I always wanted to have a real sword. And what I really liked about it, it's like probably for the same reason why there are people who really like bicycles, because it's human powered. You don't need any engine, you don't need any fuel, you don't need ammo. It's pretty much just you and the tool, right? This reproduction of an authentic medieval gauntlet is what I used when you would spar. So like after just using them, that already informed my design for some of the futuristic soldier type designs for one of the movies I worked on recently. So it's both fun, but also instructive and inspiring. And uh, yeah, actually protecting my hands really well. I was doubtful, like from the very beginning, I was like there is no way these guys were serious about it. I thought they were like joking, you know, it was like, there is no way you actually want to build a robot that big. You know, I even asked them, so why do you want to do that? I said like, well, we think the future where we can't build giant robots is cooler than the future where we cannot build a giant robot. So like, well, that works for me. But I never realized how freaking huge that thing will be when you see it in person. That was very surreal. I was like, oh my God, it's too big. <laughs> it's like, what's happening? Felt like a, like a, this geeky child who was like, oh my God, this toy came alive. A practical use for this specific robot is for uh, hazardous environment cleanups, like post radioactive cleanup to do complex mechanical operations. Like you can like open things up. You could work with tools to get dexterity of a human being, but more power. You can lift up a human with just one arm, like a vending machine or something. So it's pretty powerful. My understanding of industrial design for me was always like, okay, now, you know, the games are over, we need to make things that actually work. And the experience was the total opposite. They were like, actually, don't worry about making it work for now, let's make it look cool. Because we will always have to rationalize and scale back our imagination. But during the concept part, that's not the time to constrain imagination. And that was a, a weird contrast for me because at the same time, I was also working on Terminator Genesis. 
the direction and overall sort of director's vision and desire for concept art was like, hey, let's make it look like it makes sense. Let's update Stan Winston's iconic designs to make it look like it was a CNC out of titanium alloy. Let's make it more grounded. Because of the public's levels of taste and sophistication grew so much over the years, they're not gonna be impressed with something that looks like it doesn't make any sense. You can overall trajectory of the quality of the design in movies and games going more ground-based and more realistic. And where in the product world, I saw complete opposite. They want to actually make sci-fi stuff. They're like, dude, let's make sci-fi shit. <laughs> so the same concept of the foot in order and foot in chaos, they embraced it, except they would go like, hey, let's go both feet in chaos first, make something really cool, and then obviously we'll have to take one foot back in order because we have to build this. But it's the only way that we at least keep one foot in chaos and something cool and something that's unexpected. As Vitaly's time working on Method 2 came to a close, he began shifting his focus full-time to a secret project, an independently developed video game titled Mortal Shell. While COVID-19 heavily impacted other, larger game development studios, Cold Symmetry, the small company Vitaly co-founded, was able to keep up production thanks to their dispersed remote work model. With a core team of just 15 people, including some former co-workers from Vitaly's first jobs in the industry, Cold Symmetry launched their first game in August of 2020. Mortal Shell, with ray tracing and DLSS, was an instant success and met with widespread acclaim. So I think like in terms of inspiration, the two big things would be observing how nature is structured and also music, and for very different reason. I think like the nature is the most incredible example of engineering. And I like this example of living fossil creatures, like a dragonfly. In the relative terms, they're really old designs. They haven't really changed much. And then when you start to look at it, you see like the dragonfly's design hasn't changed because they got certain things right so long ago that they didn't really have to change. They just got it right. And to me, those kind of examples of a timeless design they're very inspiring because I look for the timeless design also in work. In a way, whatever you do in 3D, it belongs to the material world. But when you listen to music, there is no visual data associated with it. So in a way, that's like the portal to the mystical world, to something purely weird and spiritual and unexpected that it doesn't have any precedent in, in nature. People would respond to this because they would look at it and they couldn't really pinpoint like what's exactly different about it, but they just kind of liked it. It's like, you can make an, a design that's kind of aggressive looking, but you add a little bit of the element of sadness to it or melancholy, and people would be like, okay, this looks aggressive, but it's not vulgar. There is something off about it. So this element that's a bit off, I feel this is what we sense as honesty. It's important to develop your own voice it is a cocktail of ingredients in how you do it. It's a certain form that you try to finesse and you try to make it as sophisticated, but also distill and pure at the same time with your every design iteration. And that's what makes design interesting. 